Hello and welcome to The Extra Mile. I'm Linda Boudreau. Our guest today is Kathy Schramm. She is the Curator of Education at the Shadows on the Tesh and we're going to find out about what's going on over there. So Kathy, thank you for coming. Thank you for having me today. And welcome. Now, I love The Shadows on the Tesh, but, and, I, and I assume many people love it, but for those who maybe haven't been there or aren't familiar with what it is, can you tell us something about it? Sure. It's an 1834 historic house of a sugar planter's home. And of course, sugar was crucial in our area's economy. Sugar so was king for a while. Sugar huh? was king. So it is uh, now operated by the National Trust for Historic Preservation. And it's absolutely beautiful. And let me just make a plug for people that have not been. It's well worth the drive to New Iberia. And, um, and, and you have guided tours. And yes. you tell the story. And it's just lovely. Everything is uh, always something going on at the shadows. So if it's not a tour, there's usually a special event to attend. And you want to talk about some of the special events coming up. Huh? Right, right. In June, we'll be having a workshop for children ages 7 through 11. And it's a little two-day workshop that teaches them what it might have been like to live in the past. This year we're focusing on 1863, 150 years ago. Okay, and what are you going to be doing? Well, we're, we do a number of activities. Of course, that was during the Civil War. So we'll talk about how the Civil War impacted the lives of children. What were the children's responsibilities? What were the children's changes? And of course, like all children, they wanted to imitate what was going on with adults. So. Right. So how did it, now that you raised the question, what was it like for them? It was a, a difficult time because if they were attending school, the war often closed schools. Um, um, children studied at home. Um, they worked at different tasks, and in the case of the Weeks family, their grandchildren actually left the area as refugees. To keep them safe? To keep them safe. They could afford to send them somewhere else. Right. So, so they brought their belongings, essentially, and left. And where did they send them, do you know? They traveled some to Texas and some to central uh, Louisiana, but a child is a child, and so one of uh, Mary Weeks' grandchildren asked his stepfather, John Moore, to come to his party. And he said, please come soon, because I want a soon party, he said. Oh. So like all five-year-olds, the war was not so important to him, but that birthday party was. Right, right. How did the war affect the shadows and, and, and the, the family itself? Mary's children were all away from the area. Um, even her husband, Judge Moore, who was a part of the Louisiana government, was a refugee as they moved the government from town to town and place to place. She was there with her um, sister-in-law, Hannah Jane Conrad, and actually with um, three African-American women who remained with her. It was all the women? Just women, five women. Wow, she was pretty feisty though, wasn't she? She was pretty feisty. Um, a woman of her time had a certain sphere in which they did not go beyond, but right after she said that, I'm just a woman, she would always follow it by her real opinion. <laughs> you should do this or you should do that, so. Well, were they safe during the Civil War there, and, and was the house affected the house or impacted? The house was actually occupied at the time in 1863 in the fall. Um, Union troops continued to stay there for two to three months. So how were they? How did they treat Mary? Because she stayed. She did stay. Um, <laughs> she did ask for protection, you know, an officer or a gentleman to come, but it turned out to be just the ladies. According to her husband, Judge Moore, um, General Franklin proved to be a gentleman, and they didn't really destroy much at the house. They did um, tear down the fence, but. The soldiers were cooking their food and they needed the fence as firewood. So, and this was November and December and yeah. January, so there are some cold days in Louisiana. So, well, on a scale of one to ten, losing your fence is not a big deal. <laughs> right. You know, it's, Even the shrubberies were not that affected, just know, a few of those good, things. Good, good. And that's probably because she did stay and probably she did. because they treated her with some respect. And she offered her opinion. <laughs> <laughs> and she gave her opinion. So, the, the Weeks family. Lived into the in the house until when? Yeah, 1834 to 1958. That's a long time to, to live in a one house. A long time. Huh? And interestingly, it has 
plenty and plenty of items that we call collection in museum terms, but pretty much for the rest of us, it's stuff. It's furniture, paintings, clothing, documents, all of that. So, um, and 85% of what visitors see was owned by the family, and then just that remaining 15% 15 was put in by the National Trust. It, it is of the period. So everything is, is of the period, so everything, and, and mm -hmm. the period being? Mary's occupation of the house, okay, 1830s not, to 1860. So not, not, not hall? Not, no. no. We do have one room that <laughs> is his art studio, but because of his interest in preservation, all of the objects in there, with the exception of a lamp and his, his uh, paintings are of his great-grandmother's time. Because he celebrated them mm -hmm. throughout his life. Mm -hmm. He really worked hard to preserve the house and to get it uh, on the trust, didn't he? He did, he did. He spent nearly 20 years of his life working toward that goal, and he was interested in getting a national organization to accept the house. Now, today, you know, the state runs beautiful organizations for preservation, but he was living in the era of Huey Long, and he was a little uh, untrustworthy of all of that and what would happen to his home after he died. So that was his, his driving force, because he was the last of the, of the Weems right. family, right? Right. We do have living descendants, but yes, he was the last of that line. Okay, yes. so he wanted to make sure that the house was preserved mm -hmm. regardless. Regardless. And he felt that, particularly the, the architecture, he said, you, his words were, you want to see it in its actual size and scale, rather than to have to look at a picture, he said, or a picture of a picture. And it is. It's beautiful. It has those stairs, huh? Yes, it has those outdoor stairs. And that was typical of the time? It was, and that had to do with the climate, because a, a central stairwell would interrupt airflow from front to back. So the air was flow from the front of the room to the back of the house. So you went outside to go upstairs and downstairs. You did. So you didn't do that too often. M Mary did actually close it in uh, a few years after she lived in, the first lady of the house. But yes, when they moved in, it was open. Okay, so, so the house is still pretty much like it was mm -hmm. when... She lived when there she in lived 1830s there. to 1860s. Of course, we do have air conditioning. I was going to say. Okay. I was going to say. And according to our director, it's to protect the items in it, not to including, for our comfort. In, including the human items. Inclu in including it. that, yes. But that's kind of where I was going with this. In terms of just the historic preservation and what it represents, how does how do you think that the house and 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 all that it represents fits into the whole culture of Iberia Parish? to mm -hmm. tourism, to, you know, to really kind of sustaining the community and celebrating right. the past. Right. Um, for one thing, it shows us what those people's daily life was like. So we get a visual image, and then we get that verbal, uh, we have over 17,000 documents, letters, invoices, receipts, and together that creates a picture of daily life about how did these people live from day to day. And often, because of, uh, I work with the Civil War reenactment at the Shadows, I read Civil War memoirs for my job. And- Do you have a tough job you've got a tough job. I read them at home, they're my homework. <laughs> <laughs> we, um, we read those and they often contain superlatives. What was the worst? What was the best? Because they're writing them down later. And for the Weeks family documents, they're written down that day. So it's what hap what's happening. It's 100 degrees on the thermometer. I killed my large fat hog today and got this much lard. So it it's sometimes contains the superlatives, but often it's, it's a real picture of what their daily life was it's like. It's kind of like Dear Diary. It huh? is. It is. Yeah. It really is. So. And in terms of preserving that, why bother? Why bother? Um, I think that Weeks Hall gave me the answer for that one is, you know, often I can tell you what it's like, but you would um, much better see, touch, understand, read on your own about what it was like. And he felt that that would be its purpose for future generations. They wouldn't have to guess or look at a picture. They could actually step into the rooms where the events happened. 
And you can and feel it when you're there. Feel it and tell about the past. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Which does live on, I guess. It, it does. It, Hopefully, you know, some of those bad parts have gone away. That heat and, uh, the, you know, the air conditioning well, is it, nice. Well, it, it, it is a help. <laughs> yeah. It is a help. So now, now the, the house is supported financially. How? Because it's not an, it's right. not an inexpensive undertaking. No. Um, Weeks Hall... Uh, near the end of his death kept talking about the roof and and of course that takes uh, a great deal of money to repair those things there's no getting away from that but it's supported by a friends organization memberships like you have here okay. and um, it's also supported by visitors who come and grants if we write grants and then of course donors Okay. So it's, you have a nonprofit organization, mm -hmm. so you're right. able to accept donations mm -hmm. and on behalf of the Shadows of the That's Tesla. correct. So what are, what are your plans for? What are you all thinking about doing after, after the educational workshops for kids? Well, in the fall, it's, I think, some of our busiest time at, at the Shadows. We have school programs that come. Uh, in October, visitation picks up during the cooler season. There's a reason for that. <laughs> <laughs> during the cooler season, visitors come. We have a, a Civil War encampment. I'm bringing in two speakers um, to do a little Civil War tour of some local sites and we do Christmas programs and a tour of homes on Main Street in which we participate and the Shadows organizes it. So there's a lot that goes on once, mm -hmm. once the Mm -hmm. Ball gets here. Mm -hmm. Well, Kathy, how did you get involved? I mean, why are you over there at the Shadows? <laughs> well, I am at the Shadows. I was a volunteer there, and I enjoyed my time so much there. I said, whenever I leave teaching, I will look for a job like this one. And my predecessor at the Shadows uh, moved to another job, and it was perfect timing for me. So I've been there since 1995. So it's lasted a little while. <laughs> it lasted a little while. <laughs> As the uh, curator of education, what is it that you do? Well, I work with volunteers, and of course, to do, we see about 1,500 first graders in nine days in December. Whoa, talk about it picks up, huh? And that's right, and I can't see all of those alone. What do you, I, what do, you do with first graders? <laughs> they do a couple of things. They are in their curriculum. It's about the, the past and the present. So they're studying celebrations from the past. So we're talking about sugarcane harvest, but we're also talking about how the celebration of Christmas is different today than it was historically. What do their stockings look like today as compared to an 1834 stocking? Which didn't have all the goodies in it. <laughs> no. Some, some goodies, but it was their regular stocking that they wore. <laughs> it wasn't a it special was not, one. It was not a needlepoint <laughs> stocking. No, no sequins, no. <laughs> so, uh, but we do that with them. And so it's a comparison and contrast. We also have young people who are in the gifted program in Iberia Parish, and they perform the roles of people who lived at the shadows. So they memorize scripts, they wear costumes, and I was told by uh, the supervisor of instruction for that grade level, first grade level, that that is one of the ways that first graders begin to understand that they are, these people are not of their time, is their clothing, their costuming tells them that it's different. So that's an important aspect mm -hmm. of the whole The thing. contrast for them. So, so first graders come through and then... Fifth graders fifth come graders. through for architecture and meanwhile we have a lot of, you know, programs in between. We do also do a, a children's tea in December. How lovely. Again, is that just mm -hmm. a, a way to celebrate the holiday? To it, it is. Is your programming targeting children? Um, not specifically. Um, throughout the year, you just hit on the time that that is most prevalent. Um, we do photography workshops because of Weeks Hall's background. Which we was do. what? Um, he was an artist. He studied in Philadelphia at the Fine Arts Institute, and then he won a scholarship to study in Europe. And this was shortly after World War One. So he went to Europe in 1920, and he went to exhibits, he took some classes, he photographed, which of course his photographs are works of art compared to say my photographs, but you know. Um, Instagram. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and you know, so they're beautiful works of art. So that's his background. And 
he worked with Kodak and early color slide film. And oh, really? Yes. So um, he was very interested in the scientific aspect as well as the artistic one. Too. And he was quite a character, wasn't quite he? Quite a character. <laughs> I was thinking about preservation when you were talking about that. He often said that people were so interested in seeing the house, they had sneaked in on him when he was unaware. And he used to laugh that they had seen more of him than the public had seen of Gypsy Rose Lee, who was a <laughs> popular ball dancer of the time. So um, he certainly was quite a character and, and a, a large storyteller. But he also brought a lot of famous people of his he time did. to the he show, did. didn't he? And they served, a, I think, a couple of purposes. Those people were interested in the historic site. They wanted to see what he was doing. And he hoped to win a little publicity for the site. Did he get it? He did, I think. He, after those people left, it, and so we had people, movie makers like Cecil B. DeMille and D.W. Griffith and Walt Disney and uh, Tex Ritter and writers, you know, so and they Henry all signed, Miller. They all signed, his they door all signed the door as his guest register. <laughs> yes. So, what a fun thing to have, and what a good piece of history to have still it is. in the house. We often think about what is the value of the, each of these signatures oh my gosh, <laughs> and the combined value. But yes, yeah, yes. Uh, yeah. So, okay, so you have photography, and what else do you have for adults? We do gardens, uh, a lot one. of garden workshops, and talk about that since, of course, our gardens are really important and they're gorgeous. to the landscape, and they're beautiful at different times of year. You have all native plants, don't you? Mostly. Uh, you know, those azaleas, which we enjoy so much, are originally from China, but we, you know... <laughs> they've been here long enough. They've been here a long time. Right. But Hall was very much interested in that, in establishing a southern garden, and he wrote to all of his contemporaries of the time about those gardens, and Avery Island, New Orleans, right. all over, Baton Rouge, Roselawn, you know, all of those about that garden. So we also inform people about that, live oaks and bamboo last year, I think we had a the Bamboo Society held a meeting at the Shadows. Oh, really? Yes. Oh, so you can, can you use, can you like rent the Shadows out for me? Sometimes we do that. We don't do that kind of, we were the site of a photography conference, one of their events. We really can't, you know, we don't have much land area and uh, of course seating and, you know, the, the kinds of technology you need for the conference, we don't have that. And it is a historic place. You can't just go plop down in the That's living room. That's true. <laughs> we have to do most of those events outside. So Now, you have a separate building. How we does, do. How does that work? Um, we have the Shadows Visitor Center, which is across Main Street from the historic site. And it's the location where we show a film. We have a, an, a, an exhibit now, an art exhibit up uh, called Petals and Feathers. Cool. And it's for local artists. And so we can do that. There, where that's where our gift shop is, and then we use rooms just adjacent to the shadows for school programs too. Okay. And is it? It's right on Main Street. Mm -hmm. Is it, it hard is. to park? No, because the visitor center has uh, parking completely okay. surrounding okay. it. So people that haven't been, what do you think that they would most need to be aware of when they're mm -hmm. coming for the first mm -hmm. time for their shadows tour? What do they need to be <laughs> on the lookout for? You know, when I used to teach school, they used to tell me I had the largest, heaviest most boring book in their locker, students told me yeah, that. Yeah, the history book. <laughs> <laughs> the big, thick history book. Um, but at the Shadows, I think sometimes a preconceived notion is we will be talking only about stuff. And actually, when you come to the Shadows, we're really talking about people, and almost every single one of us can identify with someone like that, um, a situation in the past, how, a method of doing something. So the stuff that they see is to serve as just a visual for what they're going to hear. Because really what they're going to hear is about a family and how a family lived. Right. And in some ways it's so similar to us. Um, when I have teenagers I often talk about the boys courting the young ladies and what the process was. And just like us, you know, <laughs> similar situations occurred. And you know all this Based on the documents that On they the left. documents, yes. On those 17,000 more letters, receipts, and invoices. And even for someone who's been there a long time like me, 
you need to go back and refresh and say, let me read that again. What exactly did they say about the past? So, Now, have you always been, because you taught history. And I did. You're now an education cu curator in mm -hmm. a historic mm -hmm. home. Have you always been interested in the past? I have for a long time. I think my favorite was always Louisiana history because it was so colorful. There was mm -hmm. always an interesting story and it wasn't fiction, it was actual fact. Yeah. And so that's true at the shadows. It's, it's a wonderful story, the way we go to a movie to be entertained and it's fact instead of fiction. And you're right, it is. It's the same as going to a movie in many ways, except it's like, you know, 3D, really. 3D. Exactly, like, really 3D. Really 3D. <laughs> and mm -hmm. and uh, so how was the house built? Where, where did the house, you know, the, the plans and all that? Because right. it was kind of a good mm -hmm. story, I think. Mm -hmm. um, they hired two, you know, architects. Sometimes we say uh, Thomas Jefferson is the first American architect. But they didn't really have architects, which what David Weeks did was to hire two brothers named Bedell. And they essentially didn't have a, a plan the way we used to have a, you know, uh, like a plans, blueprint. a blueprint. And he, they uh, built the house probably over a three year period, um, getting all the materials they could from the property they owned, like Cypress and so forth. And then after that, purchasing things from New Orleans, so often we go down to the paint store and we just buy a gallon, but for them that paint has to be mixed so that it was all the ingredients to make the paint that we see in those papers. So that was quite a long process. And I think something, one of the last things to be added to the house was a lightning rod. And you know, today we think that's completely unnecessary, but at the school which I taught, lightning struck the roof of that school three times in the 15 years I was there. So it's amazing to say, oh yes, when something is the right height in the open area. So, so it was, it was set up just, mm -hmm, just exactly to withstand yeah. the climate. Yeah. And Didn't, did they sell, did it used to have a lot more land and they sold? They it? did. Okay. When the original purchase was 158 orpids which is nearly an acre. Um, and then they continued to purchase land adjacent to the property that they already owned. Okay, so they ended up at one point with a lot of land. A lot of land. And then they owned up to 3,000 acres on what's called Weeks Island today, Grand Coat okay. in the past. Okay, and that was sugarcane. That, that was their sugarcane plantation. And then as, as history goes on and as life goes on, Hall, Hall mm -hmm. basically, put all of his money into the house, didn't he? He really did. Um, his heart, his soul, and his cash. And his cash. <laughs> and he lived modestly, I think, at the end of his life. And, you know, it smiles, uh, it makes me smile when I read where he is saying, I'm getting to the age now, you know, where I'm getting creaky and he's younger than I when he's writing it. So, but I think but he lived, he lived <laughs> a little harder than I, I think so, a little faster. Um, but. He knew that that's what his goal was. He he really was an early preservationist. I think um, so. And I think we owe him a great deal. That's why I keep mm -hmm, coming back to him because mm -hmm. I think that we wouldn't have the shadows like I we have the shadows had he not done that. And I that's appreciate correct, what he did. That's correct, I think. Uh, yeah. I think he was um, in a group of New Orleans uh, people who had recognized by that time the importance of the French Quarter and started preserving it. and. Uh, that's about the times that HABS, the Historic American Building Survey, came about and they started photographing buildings in Louisiana, of course, many of which are no longer there today. So they didn't get to the National <laughs> they, <laughs> <didn't>. <laughs> the they, you know, they were, wasn't that person to motivate right, exactly. it to happen. So the last minute, minute and a half that we have, again, just to kind of recap, when, when is the Shadows open, where is it, and mm -hmm. when is your, what's your next sure. upcoming event? We are open on um, Monday through Saturday from 9 to 5. Our tours begin at 15 minutes after each of those hours, from 9.15 through 4.15 at the Shadows Visitor Center with a, a nice film that gives you a background. And our next event is our uh, Shadows History Camp. Uh, we will be having all those children ages 7 through 11, and we will be marching around the site, making flags, uh, churning butter, 
doing all kinds of historic fun and leisure. We actually are going to build some boats and race them in the pond, which is a favorite activity. We've done candle making and other things too. And you're responsible, I guess, for coming up with some of these ideas as I a am. curator? I am. Um, I usually develop an outline and then I have a nice committee and what their task is, is they usually say, Kathy, that's too complicated. We'll <laughs> simplify it. <laughs> I'll always choose the complicated one. But, but that's what we do. That's with collaboration. That's, that's exactly, right. Exactly, exactly right. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to thank you so much for coming today and for uh, sharing with us all the wonderful things that are happening out there. I am, a, as you know, a big fan of the shadows right. and hope that people will go and, and visit and enjoy our history. Thank you for having me. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. You've been watching The Extra Mile. I'm Linda Boudreaux.